Hi everyone, uh, let's begin this talk. Um, first of all, can you hear me okay? Should I distance myself away from the mic? All right. Um, so before we start, let's briefly cover who I am. Uh, my name is Michael, I'm a staff engineer on the RabbitMQ team. I have been uh, working on all things RabbitMQ for three and something years, specifically working on client libraries maybe in the first year or so. Uh, here is where you can find me on the internet. And uh, at this conference, you probably have been to at least one talk where a large organization is trying to transform itself, move away from a monolith to um, an architecture where you have a bunch of services. And there are many, many cultural challenges, for example. Uh, this talk is a bit more technical, but we only have 20 something minutes. so. Um, it won't be too technical. My goal is to outline a number of problems that you're going to face uh, in the context of RabbitMQ, but a lot of them are probably applicable uh, with just about any message and technology. Yeah, so once upon a time, there is a developer and her team faces a monolith problem, uh, and all the downsides of that are pretty well understood. We won't go into them. So. The way I have seen this happening is people begin to, they have a monolith, then they add a small service on the side and they use some kind of messaging technology to communicate with, even if it's a shared database, that kind of messaging. Uh, they add more services and everything is cool, right? They, they are able to deliver new features quicker and so on, uh, but at some point, someone reports an issue that says, hey, we don't exactly understand what's going on, but the system doesn't behave the way it's supposed to. Uh, this particular service doesn't work, uh, whatever exactly that means. And uh, someone who is tasked with troubleshooting that, it can be a developer, it can be an operations person, uh, realizes that uh, we have pretty great tools when it comes to debugging individual apps. So this is IntelliJ Ideas debugger. Um, but once you, once you have a system that looks like this, it, there is no debugger for five services, right? You cannot just add a breakpoint or pause a step into a distributed system, at least as easily, at, at least yet. So what do you do? Um, so let's consider the following uh, as small as it gets service architecture. You have uh, a publisher, you have a consumer, and R here means private and cubit. Again, it can be uh, a similar tool. So how many things can fail on this picture? Five, right? There are three vertices and two edges. And something can go wrong. Well, multiple things can go wrong. Uh, at every step. Now you can imagine once you have hundreds of services how fun this gets, but let's just use this as an example. Uh, so one example of a failure is your producer loses, let's, let's call it the ability to publish. It can be a network failure, it can be something else. We'll cover some of that. Uh, or your consumer, or, or the same happens to your consumer, or to the messaging thing that you use. Um, your publisher dies, your consumer can die, and so on. So let's focus on this publisher to, in this case, Rabbit and Um So we see our entire team participates on the Rabbit and Q mailing list, and we see a lot of things happening over and over. Of course, messaging isn't really new. Some people try to only have started discovering it with the start of this microservices trend, uh, but it has been around for decades. And some of the problems are pretty well understood, and my goal is to outline some of them. So troubleshooting publishers. How do you do that? What kind of problems you're going to face? What to pay attention to? Uh, I'm going to generalize, of course, but still. So first of all, look out for I.O. exceptions with just about any library uh, framework, what have you. Those should be re reasonably easy to notice. Uh, and they immediately tell you that something's probably isn't quite right. Uh, 
in case of RabbitMQ, in fact, multiple uh, messaging technologies, there is something called publisher confirms. The idea is pretty straightforward. A publisher publishes something and then uh, gets confirmation of some kind. Uh, this idea has been around for, what, almost four decades now. So when in doubt, just borrow ideas from TCP. They are pretty battle-tested. Uh, a lot of them are applicable at the application layer, by the way. Uh, so next thing, what if a message does get to, in this case, RabbitMQ, but it doesn't really go anywhere from there. It doesn't, it, it's routed nowhere, it's voided. Um, so in this case, Rabbit has a feature that lets you say, let, lets a publisher say, hey, please return this message to me, and then I will do something with it. Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, your publishers can be publishing something that is invalid for some <coughs> definition of thereof. So, for example, consumers cannot deserialize or decrypt it. That can be a lot of fun. Or the, the format has changed between upgrades. We won't get into that, but you get the idea, right? So, uh, keeping track of payloads can be, uh, can yield a lot of interesting information. We'll uh, go back to that in a bit. So, identify publisher instances you can have a lot of, and you probably do have a lot of instances of your app, so which one is misbehaving? Uh, if you have five of them, it's pretty cool that you can just say, hey, Cloud Foundry, run my app, and it will, but when something goes wrong, you need to be able to identify them. Um, identifying publishers that are blocked, RabbitMQ can block them, other messaging technologies have similar features. Uh, is another important thing. Uh, you may see timeouts or something like that um, in, in your application logs. Uh, so speaking of identifying publishers, there is a fairly new feature in RabbitMQ which lets you specify any name you want uh, on a connection. So that helps you identify things. Uh, it's optional and it, it can be any string you want. So RabbitMQ will display it in the management UI, mention it in the logs, and, and, and so on. Uh, so lastly, uh, publishers can retry things, and depending on your use case, uh, it may make sense to retry. In some cases, you don't want to retry, um, and yeah, keep in mind that retrying too many or too few times can potentially be problematic. Uh, ideally, retries should be locked, things like that. Uh, right, so we have a number of Spring engineers in this room, and this conference has Spring in the name, so I should mention that Spring and NQP can cover all of the issues, or at least 90% of them. Uh, I'm not going to tell you, hey, you have to use this property or whatever they're called. Um, you can just Google the docs and in the Spring MVP gu guide you are going to find uh, pointers to all of those things or RabbitMQ docs. Uh, all right, so let's focus on the consumers. What can go wrong there? What should you pay attention to? Um, again, IO exceptions, fairly obvious. Uh, inadequate quality of service in terms of delivery. So uh, let's mention, yes, yeah, something else. Uh, in RabbitMQ, consumers can acknowledge deliveries when they are done working on something. Uh, and it's important to make sure that if you use manual acknowledgements, then your consumers actually act things, but they don't do it more than once because that is a protocol exception. Uh, so again, it looks very much like publisher confirms, but inverted. RabbitMQ delivers uh, a message to a consumer, then it confirms it. And if uh, if client connection, if consumer connection goes down, then that message will be recued. Uh, yeah. So because it can be recued, it eventually will be redelivered to a different consumer or the same. So. It's fairly important to keep track of free delivery metrics. You can do it using RabbitMQ, HTTP API, and Management UI, but you can also do it in the app. Uh, 
one good example of this is you can have an infinite redelivery loop when something uh, is being delivered over and over and consumer recuse it or fails over and over. Um, and again, uh, just like with publishers, you probably are going to have a number of consumer instances and once one of them starts misbehaving, like it starts recuing things and so on, uh, you need to be able to identify which one that is. Um, and again, connect, n naming your connections is a good idea. It, it's going to help you. Uh, lastly, uh, there is a broad range of problems uh, with consumers. that they, they come down to throughput or performance, if you will, or latency in some cases. Uh, so. RabbitMQ specifically has a metric around consumer utilization. Uh, what it basically means, how, what percentage of the time uh, can RabbitMQ deliver a message to a consumer when it's ready to do so? Uh, and consumers can limit that delivery rate uh, by configuring a QoS value, uh, or it can be just a function of, you know, some consumers can be slower than others. Uh, and can only process things so fast. So if you see consumer utilization being surprisingly low, maybe you should scale up your consumer app. Again, Spring MQP uh, can help with some of the above, uh, maybe most, and we have some ideas how to make it, to get it to 100%. Um, right, so you can see a pattern maybe developing here. And there is a fellow who wrote a bunch of books on statistics, and there is a fairly well-known quote uh, from one of them. So we need to we need to uh, identify how can we collect data because without data, troubleshooting a distributed system is very very hard. Yes, there is a question. This talk is structured in such a way that it's probably better to ask at the end. Thank you. Um, right, so a, a minor intermission, speaking of data and so on, so my, my mom asks me every once in a while, hey, what again is it that you do for a living? And uh, well, I typically tell her that I make computers do things. Uh, but what I really want to tell people, judging from my participation in the rapid and mailing list is I tell people to read the FN logs. Because believe it or not, this sounds very obvious, but 40 to 50% of RabbitMQ dash users threads, uh, the first reply that people get is, hey, can you please post the logs or error messages or just what anything that would, you know, demonstrate that what you're getting? Apparently this is not as obvious as I think it is. Uh, so yeah, so how can we collect, uh, where can we collect data from that is useful for debugging in this context? So one is metrics. Uh, that is metrics that are collected by applications, but also other things. Uh, logs of your own application. Um, I hope people do log things, right? Well, with Spring it's kind of built in. Um, Someone else's log can be, logs can be very helpful because imagine that the publisher publishes something then it's done as far as, far as that service is concerned. Uh, it has nothing to log other than, hey, I have sent this, received the confirmation, all is well. Uh, but then something else somewhere fails because it failed to deserialize a payload or something like that. So other logs are also very important. And lastly, tracing data, which honestly is just a special case of metrics. So tracing, for those of you who may or may not be familiar with it, is where you get uh, a request coming in, say from a user, uh, and you trace it through every service that you have. Uh, whatever it is that you want to log or measure has a, an identifier for that request. So you can actually see how things flow through the system. So it's a, it's a kind of metrics that takes into account the data flow and every service that is involved. Uh, and finally, there is something called Wireshark. Uh, you may know it by a different name, TCP dump, 
libpcap, which is a library that both of them use. Uh, that's not really what I mean. It's, it's an app that uh, basically captures traffic and lets you query it. And it lets you see what's going on at every protocol layer, starting from the physical layer, but most useful uh, parts are probably IP, TCP, and so on. And it can also, if you give it a private key, it can decrypt TLS traffic and so on. Uh, lets you filter things, uh, navigate through frames and protocols that are related to each other. It's very extensible. It supports hundreds of protocols. And it is surprisingly little known. Um, it has been around for probably over 10 years at least. So yeah, that is, it's kind of, it's a big gun, you know, you don't want to pull it out on every occasion, but it, in some cases you just cannot do anything without capturing traffic, so. Uh, okay, so let's consider the following failure scenario. You have a, your publisher is online, your consumer is online, but whatever messaging layer you use, such as RabbitMQ, isn't. So how do we investigate what may be going on? Um, how do we collect data from RabbitMQ? So first of all, logs. Uh, Rabbit logs all the unhandled exceptions, even if they're just noise, uh, it, it logs quite a bit of stuff. In the next version, 3.7, uh, it will be easier to work with. There will be only one log file and there will be debug logging available, which you may or may not want to enable, but um, yeah, there is quite a bit of stuff logged. Um, and if you're investigating something, if you relate it to RabbitMQ, for example, if you don't have logs, uh, then please don't report any issues, not just to us, to your colleagues as well, because it's impossible to work with. Uh, RabbitMQ control status, environment, there is RabbitMQ control report, so a bunch of commands that, again, just provide you data from a running system, from a particular node, some of them can be cluster-wide. Uh, RabbitMQ top is also not a very well-known thing, but now that it ships with RabbitMQ, may, we hope it will get more attention. It's a plugin that if you're familiar with the Unix top thing that demonstrates, uh, for example, what processes consume most CPU resources or RAM or, uh, and so on, uh, perform most context switches. This is a similar tool for RabbitMQ for relying processes uh, and they can help you identify uh, yeah, all, all kinds of things. For example, what specifically uh, consumes memory. Oh, and it's a, it's a plugin which uh, has a management UI extension, so you can enable it, uh, capture some data from it, disable it, and that's it. It's not supposed to be on all the time. Now, I keep mentioning this HTTP API thing. It, this is what the ma management UI is built on and it exposes a lot of metrics, probably too many, and we keep adding more. Um, yeah, I'm kidding, there is no such thing as too many metrics. Um, so, there are enough of them that we need a reference, and the easiest way to get to, uh, to a reference for this API is just go to slash API on any RabbitMQ node that has the management plugin enabled. You don't even need, you know, you don't need to use Google for it. If you have access to a node that has management UI, you have access to docs. Uh, so try these, for example. There's just a few things that, yeah, yield a lot of data, and this pipe into Python thing is, uh, it will preprint your JSON, which is very, very useful if you're getting a few pages of data back, for example, or it can be deeply nested. Right, finally, there is a way to trace messages. It, it introduces a lot of load on the system, but you can do that if you really have to. Uh, you enable this feature, we call it the firehose. You can find it in the docs. Uh, and then you can, using a regular RabbitMQ consumer, and I'm pretty sure there is a management plugin that just logs into a file. It basically logs every single message that flows through the system. Now, you can imagine that has very significant uh, resource usage effect, but sometimes you just need something like that and it's there. Uh, lastly, infrastructure metrics. We sometimes see issues reported such as, hey, my node does this or doesn't do that, and once you take a look at uh, 
virtual machines, for example, level metrics, it turns out that the node just needs to sync from scratch, for example, from another node and you, your traffic flows kind of demonstrate that and of course it, it will block some of the operations before it does so. So those are still relevant. Um, right, so we, we are getting to a common theme, right? Collect logs system-wide. By system, I mean your entire distributed system. Collect metrics system-wide. Collect exceptions system-wide. Um, trace requests, there is a tool called Zipkin, which uh, is open source and from Twitter uh, and implements basically is, is inspired by a research paper from Google about their uh, trace infrastructure that has been in production for years. Um, so take a look at that if you can. Rabbit isn't necessarily uh, exposing a lot of data over it, but it, it can be fixed. Uh, and then analyze what you have. Uh, I personally cannot imagine any other way of debugging a distributed system problem. Now, hmm. What kind of tool can give you all of that stuff? Any guesses? No? All right. This sounds like a job for a structured platform like Cloud Foundry. And if you ever needed an excuse to introduce this to your team, uh, I seriously have no idea how do you debug such things and stay sane with IAS plus or something like that. Well, I have seen people do that. It takes a lot of effort. Cool, so uh, in my opinion, you see that I've mentioned some tools, some problems, some approaches, but like I said, there is no IntelliJ idea debugger for a distributed system. So this problem is far from being solved. We will see what kind of tools, uh, some of the tools that we need, they don't even exist yet probably. Leave alone being mature, leave alone being widely adopted, well understood, and so on. So yeah, uh, with that, thank you, and let's open up for questions. The question is, uh, uh, how can, it's easy to see how uh, consumers not acknowledging a delivery can happen, but how can uh, double acknowledgement happen? So one example is if you have a consumer which is a concurrent application and it processes things concurrently or even in parallel uh, using a shared channel and then all your consumers try to act multiple messages at once for efficiency because that's what you can do at the protocol level they will very quickly step on each other's feet. Uh, well, th there can be many scenarios. It's a matter of, it's usually a bug in the consumer. Um, we have seen scenarios such as if there is an exception that happens in the consumer, then it tries to, uh, say, requeue a message. But then in a different place, it tries to act things at the same time. It's usually what libraries do in your application. Developers are not aware of it, so you get a double act, things like that. The question is, is RabbitMQ-top, the plugin, uh, is it available in the PCF tile? So uh, I'm not 100% sure what's the most recent RabbitMQ version that is available in the tile, but as soon as 3.6.3 or a later version uh, makes it into the tile, uh, and David Histon, who runs that team, uh, uh, can come to that. As soon as that happens, you will have it available because it now ships the RabbitMQ out of the box. Yeah, so there can be possible, yeah, we have five more minutes. Uh, it, it's possible that there can be some improvements in the tile to make it easier, for example, to just enable it and then disable it 
at runtime because that's not exactly how Bosch typically works, right? Um, but it, it should be available very, very soon, if not already. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, as far as I know, well, as far as I remember, w all of the protocols supported by RabbitMQ, their URIs are injected into applications environment on Cloud Foundry. So that is one example. Uh, another example is you get a dedicated user for management access with every PCF service. So you can use that with your tooling. It's just a matter of having the credentials, having uh, access to to one of the nodes over the network. Yeah, I think I think uh, the question is: Is access to the HTTP uh, restricted? in the PCF tile? I think the answer is certainly it's not restricted. It's just dependent on how you configure your inf infrastructure, specifically your firewall rules. This may or may not be uh, possible. But if you go through the HA proxy endpoint in the tile, you should be able to get access to that API. The question is, does RabbitMQ integrate with Zipkin uh, in any way? The answer is no. Uh, once Zipkin on Cloud Foundry specifically matures, and once we figure out what would be the best way to to trace things, because it's not just RabbitMQ that is involved, right? It's also applications. Uh, yeah, certainly I personally would like to see some kind of integration at some point, but there are open-ended questions. So the question is, what happens when a consumer terminates? Uh, on Cloud Foundry, it's probably, it will be restarted. Um, if it can start at all after that, uh, presumably it reconnects and begins working again. Uh, I personally see more cases where a consumer is online, as in the app is running, but it keeps failing and failing and failing for whatever reason. For example, it cannot deserialize a payload that it is getting. Uh, that is a trickier case because as far as Cloud Foundry runtime is concerned, the app is healthy, uh, or at least many things say so, while in reality, it's not really the case. Uh, let me see if I'm getting a question right. Uh, the question is, Outside of PCF, is there tooling available for alerts and monitoring for RabbitMQ? Yeah, for example, Q, Q depths and so on. Uh, there is a colleague D plugin from the New York Times. There are similar tools. There, are not, there is nothing from our team. Uh, potentially, this is something that would be interesting in adding. Uh, yeah, the problem is. There are many monitoring systems in the world, and we simply don't have the resources to maintain 20 extensions. <laughs> so, uh, the question is uh, how does connection naming work in RabbitMQ? Uh, uh, the, the answer is you associate any name you want with a connection, and then RabbitMQ is aware of it, and it can report it in the management UI via HTTP API. Uh, it will log it in, in some cases. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's all we have for now. Uh, it's connection-based because RabbitMQ isn't aware of uh, whether what is talking to it is a single app that has multiple connections or just one, and in Spring MQP's case, which slightly complicates matters, they use caching of connections. So we will see what would be the best way to 
to produce sensible names when you have connection pooling going on. But no, Rabbit isn't really aware of apps. It is aware of connections. We have one minute, so one, one last question. The question is, which one do I recommend, Rabbit and Cure Kafka? Well, I'm, I'm certainly pretty biased. Kafka is a great tool. It does very little, but it does it very well. So it's like with databases. W would I recommend Cassandra or Postgres? I don't know what you're doing. So both of them can work fairly well. I think a lot of the problems that I covered uh, will be quite applicable to Kafka too, even though Kafka has the different protocols. And Rabbit even uh, supports multiple protocols. So. Uh, Choose whichever you like more. Okay, uh, in case you have any other questions, I will be in the hallway. Thank you very much.